Good morning, or maybe afternoon or evening, wherever you're joining us from. This is the first of our three LinkedIn sessions on our draft standard for less complex entities. I'm Tom Seidenstein. I'm the chair of the IAASB, and I'm joined by three of my colleagues, Kai Morton Hagen, a member of the IAASB and chair of the LCE Task Force, Bev Bauman, IAASB Deputy Director, and she's a lead staff in developing the LCE standard, and Amy Fairchild, a principal with the IAASB, and who recently joined us and has been a key part of getting this draft standard together. Um, I really well, just wanted to thank you for, for being with us today uh, for this session, and the purpose of it is to get feedback from our stakeholders like you which is a top priority for the IAASB. And we are always now trying new and interesting ways to improve ways we can make it easier for you to give us feedback. In many ways, our LCE standard is the embodiment of the strategy that we put together that puts the public interest at the heart of all we do. When I joined the IAASB in 2019, we committed ourselves to addressing the key public interest matter of complexity in our audit standards through a more agile standard setting process that will engage our stakeholders in an even more intensive manner. Everywhere I went, I heard that ICES was becoming longer and more complicated. Now, this is a natural outcome of a world in which transactions and structures are necessarily becoming more complex. Also, regulators are applying more scrutiny, particularly in the aftermath of corporate failures. However, we also heard that this may not be proportionate to the needs of the 90% plus of the world that are SMEs or, or less complex entities in our, our speak. So, you know, we tested out what should we do to address what we've heard that our standards are becoming less relevant to this body and the, most of the companies out there. And we ran a discussion paper in 2019 and the response has really said you needed to act. And indeed, what we saw it was a real risk of fragmentation out there. National standard setters and legislative authorities and other regulators were beginning to develop standards either for SMEs or LCEs in their own country. And we had a risk after 30, 40 years of driving globalization of standard setting for audits, that you'd have fragmentation for 90% of the world. And this did not make sense to us. So we decided to take a twofold approach. One was to reduce complexity and improve understandability for all of our standards. And we have a program called CUSP that's ongoing that will apply to all the standard setting activities. There's no need to have complexity where it's not needed in our standards. But secondly, the LCE standard is a second approach. Um, and the goal has been to have a high quality standalone standard proportionate to the needs of the LCEs. Again, as I said earlier, we're trying to adopt a more agile approach to standard setting. We were able to produce a draft standard under a year that's largely due to the team that we have on this call. And our goal throughout the process to get immediate and rapid real-time feedback from our stakeholders. Um, being able to get help from our advisory groups and our reference groups has been a huge input throughout the process. But now we're turning to you as part of the broader community for help. So let me turn it over to Amy Fairchild, who's going to lead us through the discussion today. But thank you again for participating. We really appreciate it. And we need your help. Thanks, Tom. It looks like a lot has already been done in developing this new draft, and we will come back to the input from the International Reference Group very shortly. Uh, maybe first we'll turn to Kai to explain more about what the standard is and the approach adopted to its development. Thank you, Amy. I think a good way to start is by talking about some of the broad principles behind the standard that we agreed prior to the development of the standard itself. Uh, as Tom mentioned, the discussion paper uh, gave us a lot of input, uh, which we based uh, these principles on, but also a lot of um, outreach had been done by us prior to and during the discussion that led up to these uh, projects being developed. So um, uh, some of the key principles behind this is that we developed this as a separate standalone 
standard. That means that it is developed to be an alternative to using the full pseudocode ISAs, uh, <clears throat> but we would leave it then to the jurisdiction and the firms to decide whether it should be adopted in the, in the different jurisdictions. Um, secondly, if you look at the standalone piece, it means that there is no link back to the ISAs themselves uh, in the standards or in the requirements. So it is uh, in a way self-contained. Self <clears throat> um, so we've developed uh, the draft uh, to have all the necessary requirements uh, to be needed for an audit of a less complex entity. So if you start by using this standard and um, you see that there is um, uh, requirements missing uh, from uh, to, do, to address some of the matters or circumstances that you, you could occur in your audit, um, I think then you're in the wrong standard. Uh, we've, when we uh, develop the scope or applicability of the standard, we try to make sure that we include the um, requirements necessary for an audit of a less complex entity. Um, <coughs> sorry. Uh, also, um, through the discussion paper and the other feedback, we got strong, um, strong information uh, or <coughs> feedback that um, what is needed is an audit and a reasonable assurance opinion. Um, it's something that we had discussions on with the board multiple times during or in the beginning of the development, and we uh, we ended up saying it needs to be a reasonable assurance, and that's what we developed similar to what Tom said earlier, that it, the aim here is to still have a high quality audit uh, and we're not giving in on that. It's the same assurance that in an ISA audit. Also, uh, some of the other feedback was that we're encouraged to still use the risk-based audit, uh, similar to what we have in the ISAs, and this is what uh, the auditors are used to using. Um, so that's some of the core principles. In addition, when we talked uh, talk to the um, the approach to development, uh, we focused on making sure that we include uh, the requirements that are appropriate for uh, appropriate for and proportionate to the matters and circumstances of a less complex uh, entity. Uh, so we dis designed the requirements that focus on, let's say, the core audit procedures that would be needed for a reasonable assurance opinion taking into account um, the nature and circumstance of a typical less complex entity. Thanks, Kai. So you talked about these core procedures and it'd be really interesting to know a little bit more about how these were developed. Uh, Bev, can you explain how the requirements in the new draft standard were developed and how does this then compare to the ICES? So what kind of things are included or excluded? Thanks, Amy, and, and hello, everyone. Um, we spent a lot of time trying to work out how best to develop the requirements. Um, we could have started with a blank page, um, but we had a lot of um, conversations early on about the best way to approach the development of the standard. Um, and, and we thought, what's the most effective and efficient way, recognizing that we needed something fairly quickly. Um, Kai had actually talked about the key principles um, to using a risk-based approach. Um, and we thought about that. Um, the ISAs themselves um, have been developed as a risk-based approach. Um, the ISAs are a set of auditing standards that have effectively been used in over 130 jurisdictions. So we thought that would be a good place to start. So we used the ISAs as the base to develop the requirements for the new standard. However, in thinking about that, one of the, as Tom had alluded to, um, we, the ISAs are getting more complex. They are um, getting um, harder to use, um, in particular for less complex entities. So we adapted them as appropriate for the circumstances of a less complex entity. So what does that actually mean? Um, some ISAs were excluded, for example, key audit matters, um, internal audit, group audits. There's no requirements within the standard for that because this is targeted at what we would see as a less complex entity. And that sort of comes out in the applicability of the standard, which we'll talk about on the second of these LinkedIn live sessions. We then looked at the remaining um, ISAs and, and the requirements within those ISAs. Um, some of the requirements have come in as is. They, as they, um, Kai mentioned, they are core requirements and they need it for a risk-based approach. Um, some of the requirements have been adapted or modified for the circumstances of a, a less complex entity. We were trying to leave out anything that would address complex matters or circumstances. 
And then some requirements within a standard have been omitted. For example, segment reporting, unlikely that a, a, an LCE would have segment reporting. So for example, um, I'll, I'll use accounting estimates because that's a really good example. Um, you get very basic accounting estimates and you get very complex accounting estimates. M most entities would have basic accounting estimates. So we needed a, a procedures in for or requirements in for those basic accounting estimates. So we have included those, but where you get into really complex accounting estimates, then we haven't included the requirements for that. Um, and a lot of this is explained in the authority of the standard or the applicability of the standard, which again, as I said, we will address that in more detail on the second of the LinkedIn live sessions. Um, if you are curious as to what's in, what's out, um, we do have on our website, uh, we call them mapping documents, and it shows the ISA requirements mapped to the LCE standard. Um, with an explanation of what's in, what's out, why we've included certain things. Um, those documents are, can be used as reference documents. They're not part of the consultation, but they may assist in trying to determine whether the standard is appropriate or not for the use in an audit of an LCE. Thanks, Amy. Thanks, Bev. So that makes it a bit more familiar to those using the draft standard, which, which makes sense. Uh, Kai, maybe you can elaborate a bit more on the similarities and the differences to the ISIS themselves. Sure, I can explain some of that. Uh, I think as Bev said, and I, I also explained earlier, we are using a risk-based approach. So similar to the ISAS, it's based on the same risk model using inherent risk, control risk, and uh, detection risk. So that should be familiar to the ones using the standards. Um, we've also, uh, similar to the ISAS, uh, developed this as a principle-based standard. Um, uh, when we start to look into what's the, some of the differences to the ISIS themselves, you can see uh, if you look at the structure and flow uh, of, of the standard itself, uh, this standard is broken up to different parts and follows the, the flow of an audit uh, rather than being more topic, topic specific that you have in the ISIS today. Um, uh, one example of that uh, is... Uh, uh, when you look at the requirements for concluding and evaluating at the end of the audit, they're all put together in one part rather than being uh, split out by different topics. Um, so if you look at the, the flow of the uh, flow of the audit, as I said, it's been developed to follow that, then, um, then um, the first three parts address uh, the overall concepts and matters relevant to the audit, and then the six following parts relate to the uh, the different parts of the audit from planning throughout to reporting. <clears throat> uh, similar also to the uh, ISAS, there is an overall objective of an audit, which is similar to what we have in the ISA uh, 200 um, in, in the ISAS itself. And then um, in order to help the auditors to make sure that they gather sufficient appropriate audit evidence, we've developed, we have an, we have a, um, an objective in each part of the standard itself. Um, those parts or those objectives uh, may be somewhat similar to some of the objectives that you have in the ISAS, but they're also uh, and then being tailored to, to specific to what we have in the standard itself. Um, one of the other differences looking at um, at the standard is that we have not included any application material as we have in the ISAS. Uh, what we have though, is that we well, we acknowledge that there is a need for some ex guidance or explanatory material. So we've developed something included, something that we call essential explanatory material, uh, which we in the standard refer to as EM, uh, that will help explain the implementation of uh, requirements and also um, where it is most essential. So uh, a lot of this is based on relevant application material from the ISS, um, but it's um, the further specified and be tailored to the needs of a less complex audit. Um, when we finalize this standard, we also have uh, some of the areas where we ask for feedback in the consultation also uh, is uh, what kind of guidance is needed in order to support implementation and use of the standard. So it's something that we need to think about a bit more, whether what we have in the EM is sufficient or uh, if there is something else needed or additional needed to help to do that. Um, also, um, as Tom said in the beginning, uh, 
um, the requirements and the ISOs themselves have become more complex, um, both in the way they're written, uh, but also uh, the feedback said that uh, uh, it's uh, sometimes uh, difficult to get the or to understand the expected output of a requirement. Uh, to try to address uh, some of that feedback, we we've written the requirements to be more focused on the expected output. Uh, and to use a clear and understandable and concise language as possible. Thank you, Kai. It will be really interesting to see from the consultation if a standard that's built from these principles are what the stakeholders are looking for. Uh, Tom had mentioned the use of an international reference group at the start to help develop the standard. Uh, Bev, maybe you could tell us a little bit more about that. Yes, um, it was a great way for us to get ongoing feedback um, during the development process. Um, as Tom had mentioned, um, as the RAASB, we are thinking of new approaches um, at the, sort of as part of our agile standard setting to collect more real time information earlier in the process and to feed that in as we were developing and drafting the standard. So a little bit more about the um, international reference group that we had, we wanted to hear from um, representatives who perhaps didn't ordinarily feed into our process. Um, so we, we got together a group of 15 um, representatives um, and these were from or individuals from the global community. Um, so we had representatives from countries like Indonesia, Thailand, India, Hong Kong, Argentina, Morocco, so just to name a few. Um, we have a lot of jurisdictions that don't ordinarily feed in but the standard probably would be ideal for those jurisdictions. So it was important that we also get input from them. Um, we met regularly with this international reference group on a um, sort of providing input as we were developing the standard, starting with the key principles all the way down to when we were doing the detailed drafting. So they reviewed what we were doing and they provided input and it was built in as we were going along. And obviously their feedback was, was fed back to our board. And it was really important. Um, they they gave to give a or they helped give a steer during the, the process during, in in real time. Um, they gave great feedback, um, and a lot of their feedback has been built into the standard. Um, and we really appreciated the time and the effort that these representatives had given in this process. Um, for the RWSB, this is a new model, um, but we're likely to use this model and apply it going forward where it's appropriate to do so. Thanks, Amy. So talking of new approaches, the part on reporting looks a little bit different from the other parts. Uh, Kai, can you talk us through that? That is correct, Amy. Um, part nine of the standard, as you said, it's uh, uh, forming an opinion and reporting. Um, it looks different uh, to reporting a, what we have in the ISIS as well. In the ISIS, we have uh, several separate standards. Um, addressing reporting, including how to deal with modifications and other information and so on. Uh, as we said earlier, one of the goals of the development was to develop a draft, a draft uh, is to keep it succinct, uh, at the same time, make sure that it include all the core requirements needed. Uh, we tried multiple different ways of addressing this. Um, um, I think we, or we believe that what we have in the standard now uh, is uh, enough to, uh, or is sufficient for the um, auditors to um, determine the appropriate reporting uh, and also help them um, to uh, on how to develop that. Um, we have also developed a supplemental guide uh, that explains a bit more into some of the details. Um, so if we, we say a little bit more about the, how it really is different is that part nine has uh, specific procedural requirements re relating to reporting, uh, but different to the ISS, we have specified the content and format of unmodified opinion. So by doing that, we, in a way, embedded the requirements that we uh, otherwise would need to have in the standards. We've embedded them into the illustrative report, uh, not having to uh, split them out specifically. Um, and um, the only time you can depart from the wording in the in the illustrated report is if it's uh, uh, to comply with law or regulation or to modify the opinion itself. The report itself looks familiar to what you're used to uh, in an ISO report. It is has the same or similar structure and content, but it clearly states uh, and uh, refers to the audit is uh, performed under the ISO for LC, so that. Uh, the, the users of the financial uh, statement could 
and the auditor's report can see which standard is used for the audit itself. <coughs> to deal with how to, um... A lot to consider here, but we welcome a new innovative approach to how the standard is being developed. It'll be really interesting to see stakeholders' views about this. So talking about stakeholder views, is there anything specific stakeholders should keep in mind when reading the standard and responding to the consultation itself? Uh, for example, you know, which stakeholders are we focused on or is this for everybody? Uh, Bev, maybe you could start. Thanks, Amy. Um, yes, so we have with all standards or exposure drafts that we issue, we issue what we call an explanatory memorandum. And it is a very helpful document because it really explains some of the thinking um, behind some of the decisions that were made. Um, this is a new process for us. It's something that we're developing. It's a new standard. Um, it's very important that we get feedback, um, but but it's also really important that you understand sort of the thinking behind um, how we made the decisions as to how the, sta the standard was was developed. Um, so we'll we'll we've explained some of the background and our general approach, some of the things we've been talking about on this call. Um, we explain the scope and the authority, which as will be on that second LinkedIn live session. Um, we've talked about the key principles, the content of the requirements and the EM, sort of some of the things we thought about when um, deciding how much um, sort of material or explanatory material to include in the standard. Um, we've also talked about some other things that we've been thinking about and that we've heard about in, in our outreach, things like transition out of the standard. So you're going along, you're doing your audit and you need to transition out. Um, we're looking for stakeholder feedback on that. Um, also, the approach to maintaining the standard. So how often should the standard be updated? Should it be updated when the ICES are updated? Or should we keep a stable platform and do it every couple of years? And, and how many years would that be? Um, and then obviously also a little bit around the effective date, which we always ask in our consultations. Um, we've also explained quite a lot in group audits. And again, group audits will be discussed on a later LinkedIn live session. Um, it, is a, it was a big decision for us to exclude group audits. Um, we've been thinking about it and we really are looking for stakeholder feedback on, on whether or not to include group audits. And if we decide that we will, which the, the IWSB is open to hearing the views of its stakeholders, um, how we would actually include group audits in the standard, remembering that it's a standard for less complex entity. So that would be less complex groups. And what does that mean? So the, the consultation is not only for those directly using the standards, so for the auditors, the regulators, um, but also those using um, the audited financial statements, the users of the financial statements. Um, it's very important to us that, that the users see this as a quality audit and will also value the audit opinion. Um, so we've asked lots of questions in the, the standard, particularly targeted those that, that are more sort of technical questions, um, but we would like to hear from everyone. You don't need to answer every single question um, obviously, whatever stakeholder group you're representing, it is very, very helpful for us to get your input. Um, it's also really important if you particularly like something in the standard to provide feedback on, on, on what is supported so that we don't actually change it um, as we sort of finalize the standard. Um, so really, the biggest questions we need answered um, as um, the stakeholders work through this is can the standard be used? And very importantly, will it be used? So it may, may work technically, but will it actually be used and accepted and, and adopted in various jurisdictions? Thanks, Amy. Thanks everybody. So it's a lot to take in. Um, I'll turn back to Tom now. So as part of the new approach used on this project, the IAASB has a number of planned webinars, events and presentations in the coming months, um, including this LinkedIn Live series. Why is it so important to hear from a wider group of stakeholders, Tom? Thanks, Amy. It's so, again, thank you for everyone who's joined. I see a quick question for the, from the audience uh, asking about whether LCEs and small companies are the same. In most instances, probably. And speaking of our series, I think the next one's on the authority of the standard, if I'm right, and you could learn more about what's in and what's out from the LCE standards. But it's hard to categorize because there are plenty of small companies that are complex, like some small financial institutions. But if it's a small mom and pop shop that we think of, it, probably yes. And so as you said, through our outreach, you can learn, learn more about what's in and what's out for the standard. Um, and get back to our outreach plan. Let me just say this is that we, we need your help in making this standard as high quality as possible. 
that it's proportionate both to the public interest in having high quality audits and LCE um, and the needs of the LCE community. So we are putting together what I think is one of our most comprehensive outreach plans out there. And it's available on our website to see all the different ways that is that we're seeking out at your input. And we're trying to make it as easy as possible for you, our stakeholders, to participate. Um, we have this line about meeting you where you want to be met, rather than necessarily where we want, we expect you to beat us. So um, in particular, I want to highlight the need to get input for three specific groups, which is users of LCE financial statements, such as banks, company registers, and tax authorities. So if you're out there or you know that, please point out uh, that this standard's under consultation and uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're meeting your needs. Um, firms and practitioners that serve LCEs, does it address the requirements that are relevant to these audits? Is it usable or fit for purpose? For bodies that have a role in setting standards or regulate or have oversight over audits of the LCEs, and this particularly in national standard setters or jurisdictional standard setters, will this work for you? Uh, will you adopt it? Is it relevant? So please give us your input. Amara says, we hope this is a real groundbreaking standard. Uh, we're humble enough that we know we're not at the finish line uh, and that's why your input is so important. So please participate in whichever way you can and give us as much feedback as possible. And thank you for following all of our activities. Amy, back to you. Thank you. So thank you to everyone for tuning in. So we hope this was useful. So if you would like more information on the proposed standard, uh, do check out our website and social media for further information. So on our website, we have a dedicated focus area uh, page specifically for the proposed ISA for LCE and includes some videos explaining our standard, which are also on YouTube and a number of guidance and background documents. So do check that out. If you did enjoy this session, uh, join us for the other linked live sessions. So the next session is on October 20th at 8 a.m. And we'll talk about which entities the proposed standard can be used for, who makes the decisions regarding use of the standard and how those decisions are made. And then the third and final live stream in this series will air on November 17th um, at 8 a.m. Eastern, so at the same time as this one. Um, and we'll discuss what the new proposed standard means for audit firms and practitioners. So things like the benefits, what firms and engagement teams need to consider when they're making their decisions and the potential impact on small and medium sized practices. So if you miss those dates, they're also on, on LinkedIn. And so you can uh, register and sign up for these sessions or just join them as they're going on. Uh, so we hope you can join us there then and uh, have a wonderful day, everybody.